Good morning, everybody. So it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, in the introduction, I would like uh, to present briefly the transdisciplinary mission of our grad school, the Shishukan, that's our nickname. And this is particularly uh, at the attention of our uh, international guests and uh, also other guests from, from Japan. So this, this will be quite short. And after, the students will give a two, three minute introduction to their poster to appeal and show the interest, value, and significance of their research for survivability studies, or Sogo Sezongaku, as we say in Japanese. So I'd like to first, you, you know I'm French, so you, maybe you already hear it, and um, I will also try to translate some of the ideas that we do here and in, from different, different perspectives, from a philosophical and comparative perspective. So I'd like to, to start with the paradox of our so-called scientific age and using the words of Edgar Morin, French philosopher Edgar Morin, in this book published by the UNESCO. Let me quote him first. The 20th century produced gigantic progress in all fields of scientific knowledge and technology. At the same time, it produced a new kind of blindness to complex, fundamental, global problems. And this blindness generated countless errors and illusions, beginning with the scientists, technicians, and specialists themselves. So the paradox here is that when science developed through hyper-specialization, it developed by, with this paradigm of disjunction, you know, like dividing core elements. So we, the more we know, the more we know in terms of parts, of elements. But we have lost the perspective of the whole. So the more we know in terms of the part, the more we are ignorant in terms of the whole, or what he calls the complexity, how things are interwoven together. And this is why he's saying, why we have this problem? Because the major principles of pertinent learning are misunderstood. Fragmentation of learning and compartmentalization of knowledge, or hyper-specialization, if you want, keeps us from grasping that is woven together in Latin complexus. So Edgar Morin is a thinker of the theory of complexity. Sometimes it's translated in Japanese as Fukutasuse. But it's a little bit different because it's not that things are complicated, it's things are interdependent. So then the solution for this education in, for the future, according to Morin, is education for the future must make a concerted effort to regroup the scattered knowledge from the natural sciences to situate the human condition in the world, in the physical world, from the social sciences to shed light on the human multidimensionality and complexity, and integrate into the scientific knowledge the priceless contribution of the humanities, and not only philosophy and history, but also literature, poetry, and the arts. And I will explain very briefly today why also those other aspects, or cultural aspects, are central for our survivability and resilience. So this is uh, in this uh, aim, uh, according to, to using Morin's words, to regroup, in order to regroup the scattered knowledge, uh, uh, Kyoto University has established this new transdisciplinary field, Sogo Sezongaku, uh, uh, Advanced Integrated Studies in Human Survivability, and mainly using those uh, three main branches of knowledge, and uh, in order to integrate them uh, in a practical way as well. And this is why our students here uh, are given uh, lectures on uh, what we call the HASHI, the eight branches of knowledge, medical life science, informatics, environmental studies, science and engineering, humanities and philosophy, linguistics, and even art, as we will see, economics and management, and law and politics. So, let me also uh, uh, mention this uh, idea that we aim at combining informing and educating. And I, 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 uh, uh, I'm grateful uh, to uh, Mr. Bolico. Yesterday we had a discussion about this. And sometimes it is in, in companies or in the business world, uh, people use those uh, terms as hard skills and soft skills. So hard skills basically is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Extremely important and it can be uh, uh, we use sometimes intelligence quotient, but also it is recognized more and more uh, that soft skills are important as well. So I will say that those skills correspond to culture, arts, social competencies, and ethics. And now we have also this notion of emotional quotient. 
But what I would like to say is that those soft skills are actually the hardest. And, uh, but both are necessary, and this is, I think, the aim of the school through uh, its program, as we will see. And I would like to mention that the Japanese word for mind is also the same word for heart, it's kokoro. And the, so the aim of this program, maybe through this uh, Japanese uh, philosophical uh, background, is to combine both in order to train the full personality. So our program is uh, uh, nicknamed Shishukan because it is based on the so-called model of Mon Shishu. Mon is listening, she thinking, and Shu practicing. So the idea is to bridge academia and the real world. And this is how we can combine those hard skills and soft skills. So basically, this is a five-year program. So first, listening. So students are taking different classes, different lectures. And then thinking, we have to produce some research by their own, so to think by themselves, if you want. And SHU is a kind of practicum, it's a kind of internship. So basically, now some of our students are preparing internship in UNESCO, or in, uh, in UNEP, in UN, etc. So this is a basic philosophy. So being myself uh, a philosopher and specialist of Asian philosophy, let me explain a little bit more the background or the, the history, if you want, of this uh, Monchi SHU model and why it is uh, connected with this uh, education of global leader of, of the full personality. So, Mon Shishu is actually the, three, uh, the name of the three wisdoms. Mon E, the wisdom born from listening and study. Shi E, the wisdom born from personal reflection. And Shu E, the wisdom born from practice and experience. So actually, this, the origin of this model is um, very old, we, and we have to uh, go back uh, to probably to India. And, uh, but the basic idea is that at the first level, we need first to be open, right? Open to new ideas, open to new knowledge. So this attitude of, of openness, of curiosity is extremely important. And then it's not only in order to integrate this knowledge, there is a necessity to think by oneself. And it's not just thinking about things in general, thinking by oneself, how does it apply to one's own condition and, and one's experience. So, and then the final uh, 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 wisdom, and this is a progression toward wisdom, is this embodiment of this knowledge. So bridging knowledge and experience, bridging knowing and being. So this is uh, uh, the definition for our Asian philosophy of wisdom, a uh, very integrated type of knowledge, and maybe uh, let me translate it into modern words, according to those uh, psychologists. Wisdom is the integration of the affective, cognitive, and cognitive aspects of human abilities in response to life's tasks and problems. So this is, if you want, the background. So the origins uh, 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 are very uh, ancient. And we have, in, for example, in Chinese Buddhist canon, many, many hundred, uh, 771 times this occurrence of Manchishu. But uh, from a comparative perspective, it is also very uh, pertinent if we compare it to ancient philosophy in the West as the love of wisdom. So this is, I think, a beautiful perspective to have. And let me now say why. In uh, the Shishukan, we also provide some Bunka Jishu. Bunka Jishu is a sculptural practice, so the students are able to, to train in tea, flower, and calligraphy with the best masters of Kyoto. So we could think this is kind of asobi, a kind of entertainment, but this is not only the case, I believe. Why? Because all those arts are uh, uh, understood under the label of Do, the way. So what is the way? The way is this uh, a, a path of, uh, of um, self-improvement, but also yesterday I was uh, talking with the Kanemura Sensei, actually. Uh, the way in, in, in Chinese is not only... Uh, is actually the natural way of the universe, so the natural harmony of the universe. So the goal of those practices is not to create something new, is more to become in harmony with the universe, to become receptive first. So this is done through uh, practice, exercise, training in order to acquire the skills and master the forms while seeking for the way. But this is not only done for oneself. Of course, for example, in tea ceremony, the relation with others is very, very important. And we have here this fundamental notion, and I think it's extremely important for resilience. This is uh, uh, in uh, Confucianism, uh, underst uh, understood as a jin, uh, made by the character of man and two. So this fundamental relation of human people 
um, shows us the fundamental virtue of humanity, which is altruism. And I believe that humanity has survived until now thanks to mutual aid. And now there's a lot of research showing from various point of view, from evolutionism, etc., that humanity can only survive through altruism. And I, I'm French, but uh, let me say that also uh, Japan, Japan actually was known originally as wakoku, and wa means harmony. So this, this idea of that, how to live together, how in order to survive. And I believe that this idea of altruism and mutual aid is not only necessary at a local level, but at the global level, because everything is interdependent more than ever. So I think that all those cultural heritage, if you want, are key resources to cultivate this potential, this altruistic potential that we all have. And I would like to, uh, to invite people to go beyond the limited model of homo economicus. Now it's being, it's being challenged, and I think many, many problems that we experiment now are coming from this belief. Because I think it's, it is a belief. So altruistic attitude, altruism, is actually a fundamental uh, potential of humanity, and it can be cultivated. And I believe that the, the, the way to cultivate it is culture. And it is clearly enhancing resilience. Why uh, we need to use this cultural uh, uh, um, heritage or, or resources? Because even if we were to conceive the best technological solutions to our so-called global problems, we need to think that they will be used by human people, and not only with their rationality, but also with their emotions. And I'm not saying that we should get rid from emotions and being, becoming robots, but I'm just trying that there are ways and arts and resources to become more emotionally intelligent and becoming maybe homo sapiens 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 because now actually we are more like homo sapiens demons it's even more true for man man-made problems and for purely destructive technologies such as nuclear weaponry and in case of a disaster self-management is a key competency for survivability and resilience and as a uh, French citizen, I was already here in 2011 during the Tohoku earthquake, and I was impressed by the attitude of Japanese people. And I think this is because of this cultural background. All, this, all those ideas are actually deeply uh, 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 present in Japanese culture. So we have to pay respect to it, and maybe now scientifically and philosophically reconsider them and reactualize them in new ways that are necessary for survivability studies. So I would say that the cultivation of human flourishing and ethical competences are not only soft skills, but core skills for our very survival. And in order to quote Morin as a conclusion, while the human species pursues its adventure under the threat of self-destruction, the imperative has become to save humanity by realizing it. And this is actually, uh, is playing with the word in French, is because actually it's uh, French, uh, it's uh, sauver l'humanité en la réalisant. So in French, uh, a human and human with an E uh, are actually the same meaning. So human is just being human. Human is more being nice, like in, in, in a human way, but more like in an ethical way, or in a kind way. But this is also clearly connected to the ideal of humanism, being humanistic, for the love of humanity, for the, for the, uh, care, caring for humanity. And this is also clearly connected with the humanitarian ideal. So all those notions are interconnected, and maybe we should be aware of this, and uh, let me say, uh, as a final word, uh, before becoming transhuman, let's first try to become really human if we want to survive. So thank you very much for your uh, attention, and I would like now to start uh, with the uh, students' Introduction to their posters. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Go Okui. I'm a third year student of GSIS. And um, I specialize in philosophy. And my uh, focus, my research concerns uh, the practice of uh, public philosophy and uh, with this focus on uh, Hannah Arendt's notion of census communis. Um, Arendt is uh, uh, considered as one of the most uh, prominent and uh, influential political thinkers of, t of the 20th century, and uh, known chiefly for her contributions of the theories of totalitarianism, um, uh, the, the, the theory on uh, banality of evil, uh, as well as her magnum opus on the, the human condition. And 
uh, the prospect, uh, prospect of my research is uh, to uh, pr propose a model of the practice of public philosophy, um, reflecting Arendt's notion of um, a political, uh, I mean Arendt's conception of uh, political philosophy. Uh, but what is uh, public philosophy and, and what does its practice entail? Uh, well, uh, public philosophy, um, since it's a, a since its uh, introduction to our uh, modern vocabula vocabulary is rather recent, uh, only about half a century ago, uh, we don't yet have a standard uh, definition, but here I designate public philosophy as the practice of uh, philosophy in the public, uh, which entails the non-academic settings. Uh, defined as such, the public philosophy can uh, reap contribution from Arendt's political philosophy especially with regard to her uh, theory of practice. Uh, in order to fully appreciate her theoretical contribution, uh, the understanding of the role of common sense uh, becomes the, the key in developing actionable practice of political theory, of her political theory. Um, but what is in the way of developing the theory of uh, practice uh, according to Arendt uh, is the tension between uh, philosophy and politics. The philosophy in its tradition since Plato is disposed to assume a singular perspective, uh, par rent. Uh, but however, a public as well as political sphere is uh, conditioned by polarity. So the tension between uh, philosophy and politics can be translated as a tension between the condition of singularity and polarity. Okay. So understanding uh, the faculty of census communis enables one to mediate the tension uh, between uh, the philosophy and politics um, as far as my research is concerned. So reflecting on such theoretical groundworks, uh, I am planning to develop actionable uh, model of uh, the practice of public philosophy. And I think uh, Isobe Sensei, I raised the point of, uh, about public awareness uh, at the end of uh, yesterday's session. Uh, but I think we can all, all agree that uh, public awareness is an essential component in addressing any of the uh, exist, uh, existential problems. And I would like to uh, uh, demonstrate with my poster how my research on public philosophy uh, can make contributions in this regard, theoretically as well as in practice. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yunian Pang. I'm from GSI's grade two. And my, uh, my study is intercultural communication through art and entertainment. And uh, according to my study, that the, uh, be, you know, that the, com uh, the world, had, because the communication problem and the transportation problem, we have a very different culture all around the world, and that creates very different cultural value. And when a foreigner, like foreign student, come to a different cultural environment, that will cause a very stress that because he cannot understand why they are doing that, why they behave like that, why they are talking like that, uh, that may cause a very big stress for them. And I find that traditional education is not effective uh, as we thought because the education the itself is a kind of stress to somebody, some, some people who is not very much like ed be educated by others. And so, What's a very uh, effective way to make the c communication? I think it's through, through subconsciousness. That's why I, I prefer to use art and entertainment to realize that. And in my laboratory, we try to use very high technology thing to realize a very interesting artwork that uh, the usually people can never see through some high technology. The first work is the sound of Ikebana. We use, uh, ha we use, we put some paint on a speaker and then use the computer to control the sound and the sound vibration cause the material jump up and we use high speed camera which is 2000 frame per second to shoot that. And then the final work is like this, is a very interesting shape and is 
And because the shape is very similar with uh, uh, traditional Japanese flower arrangement, so we g give it the name, sound of kebana to it. And that is exhibited in all around the world and very, uh, get very high evaluated by the audiences. And the second word is genesis. Uh, we put dry ice in uh, liquid gel and the, the gas the generated from the dry ice c c create glass-like bubble. And we, when we exhibit this into, uh, in a temple, the monk said that it's very cl close to the uh, thought, the philosophy of Zen in Buddhism. And uh, that's why it's very, uh, get applause by the monks and the audiences. And uh, not only the art, the art is, it has a very far away to somebody, but actually art uh, and movie and animation is very easy to access in our life, our life. So it's a very high effective, like if we prov uh, produce a movie that thousands of millions of people will watch it, so that's a very effective way to, uh, to realize cultural communication. So I, I think this, this kind of through subconsciousness to communication can get a very high effective way to realize that uh, our goal. Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Yuka Ohashi. Uh, this is the title of my poster is Impact of Mother's Working Situation on Girls' Education in Nepal. Uh, I will briefly introduce why I have interested in this theme. I have been interested in the way to make uh, international aid projects more effective. Among those projects, I have been interested, I especially choose uh, the project aiming uh, gender equality. Uh, actually, this is one of the sustainable development goals, so it is, means it is considered as a major global issue. Uh, among those projects, women's empowerment have become increasingly spotlighted, both as uh, the tool to measure uh, two uh, for a, a two and both as a goal. When women's empowerment considered as a tool, uh, they usually uh, measure the impact of uh, women's empowerment on household. In addition, uh, the correction of gender-based statistics and creation of indicators are uh, both uh, developed so in my research, I will do the empirical research for the impact of women's empowerment on household by using the gender-based statistics. There are three main uh, concepts for my research. Uh, one, first one is women's, the definition of women's empowerment. It is, depends on the researcher or the institution in previous research. Here, I defined it, women's empowerment like this in my research. Second, uh, there are many, uh, second, the measurement of women's empowerment. Uh, the measurement of women's empowerment is a compre comprehensive one. S however, in my research, I will use women's decision making power in household and working hours at the labor market in my research. Third, the how to measure the impact on household. It is also, there is many indicators to measure the impact on household. However, in my research, I will use children's educational performance uh, performances. Details of my research will be uh, on the poster. So please see my poster. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kota Fuzuki, and I will explain about our joint research of visualization of relationships among 12 global issues, preliminary study based on cable search. As you already know, 
There are a lot of global issues happening in the world, and a lot of people trying to resolve those issues, such as ecosystem destruction, global warming, and food of fear. Um, but in order to resolve those, uh, sorry, those issues are known to be interacted to each other in a very complex way. But so, in order to resolve those issues, we should know how to interact it with those each other. It may be this, like this. So, but what is like exactly? We don't know a way to understand those issues relationships uh, or from the overview point. So our research attempts to make visualizations of those relationships among global issues. In order to do that, we should know how closely those, those issues are interacted with each other. We assume that two issues will to be more likely to appear in the same article if they have relationships. It means we, we decided to focus not the research substantive material, but research article itself. Let's move to the methodology part. We use the SINI research article searching engine. And we counted the research article in Japanese in which global issues are appearing. And we calculated the jackal distance of those issues, which we explain the similarity over here, the frequencies of two issues appearing in the same article. And we put on the put on those Jackal distance scale and a two dimensional graph with a way of multi dimensional scaling. This is our result one. As you see, uh, we, pick, we picked up one issue from column A and one from line B, and, and with the equation below, we, we calculated those jackal distance. And uh, the, I'm sorry, the number is too small, but the close to zero the jackal distance is, the more frequent those intersecting two issues are appearing in the same article. This is our result too. Uh, we put on the, the jackal distance of each issue in a two-dimensional graph. And as you see, uh, uh, those global issues it seem to be classified into four clusters. But, um, in order to interest, in, if you're interested in our research or talk about more, please come to our research poster. Thank you for listening. Okay, good morning. I'm Ando Yuta in the Graduate School of Engineering. We are not a uh, Shishukan student. And today I'd like to talk about sustainability um, and our group's activi uh, activities. Uh, our group's Ecole de Kyodai, its name, um, is not a laboratory, uh, but a project led by uh, volunteer students and, and professors. From now, uh, I will introduce our idea on sustainability and uh, our activities. The environment, environmental problem is interconnected pro complex problem. Uh, here, what does sustainability stand for? What and until when do we have to sustain? Uh, we, consider, we consider that it will depend on time scale. Um, it's inevitable that our environment and human life will, be, uh, will keep changing, as if the Earth will be ruined in far off future. <coughs> Kyoto University is in Kyoto. Kyoto is, uh, Kyoto is a million, millennium old city. And so people in Kyoto can recognize a uh, thousand years of time as a something uh, directly connected to contemporary society. Meanwhile, Kyoto University is now conducting a variety of environmental actions, like this. As a mission of university in Kyoto, uh, we should pass to the knowledge and experiences and the spirits, spirits of academic freedom and, and dialogue. That will be a foundation 
on which the future generations explore, explore the way of sustainable society. As a first step, we are trying to establish sustainable campus. Um, our group, called Kyodai, is a university-wide activity led by student initiative. And our slogan is think globally, act locally, fill in the campus. <coughs> For instance, we organized 100 people discussion event. This event encouraged the interdisciplinary discussions and the connection uh, we could we could hear, read here. Um, this, this connection uh, helps organizing the further events which many people can attend. Uh, I cannot express uh, explain in detail uh, our um, various activities. Uh, please have a look at our posters. Thank you for your attention, and please join us. <laughs> My name is Sun Ye. My major is environment management, and today I want to talk my, uh, about my research. It's about benthic invertebrates and uh, their uh, habitats. Benthic invertebrates are organisms that live in the bottom of the water. The community of benthic uh, invertebrates are strongly affected by environmental conditions, factors like sediment composition, water quality, and hydrologic factors. Because the benthic community is uh, uh, so dependent on the environmental conditions, uh, they also served as uh, biological indicators for environmental management. However, the spring studies and the benthic invertebrates uh, studies in relation to spring habitats are still considered to be limited. So the purpose of this study is to uh, investigate the Benthi community in the Gamada River, uh, Japan, and uh, also the environmental conditions there. The data collected from the field research showed the differences and variation of uh, Benthi community in relation to the environmental characteristics. If you want to know more about the details and findings, please come to the poster session. Thank you. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shutaro Takeda from Graduate School of Energy Science, and this is a collaboration research between GSITES and Harvard University School of Public Health. So nuclear fusion, it is an opposite reaction of normal nuclear fusion that is today and it is one of the promising future energy sources. It powers the sun, and how it works is that two hydrogen isotopes fuse together to create a helium atom and a huge energy. This reaction is safe, is, we, you know, we envision it to be safe, no chance of critical air accident, and it is sustainable because these hydrogen isotopes can be obtained from seawater, and it is zero emission because it only emits helium. So it is estimated that it can fulfill the entire energy demand of human population for the next 40 million years. But the authors really realize that it can be used for more than just electricity generation. So here comes biomass, the main character of our story, which can be wood chips or organic waste. And we found that through the high heat generated by the, generated by the nuclear fusion, we can actually synthesize gas burnable gas, CO plus H2. And we can convert the synthetic gas into liquid fuels like diesel or methanol. So through these reactions, we found that the energy output from the thermal energy to chemical energy can be multiplied by the factor of 2.7. So we have designed a 
nuclear fusion gasification plant, which is an entirely new plant based on that idea, and calculated some of the details. And we have found that this plant design is technically, engineeringly feasible. So this is a new idea that can be achieved, that can be start construction today. So what we are aiming with this nuclear fusion gasification plant is a planet like this. So there is a gasification plant, and the feedstock of the gasification plant, as we discussed, can be just wood from the forest or food, food waste from the cities. And the fuel of nuclear fusion is, comes from the seawater. And we can generate some synthetic gas or liquid fuel sustainably. Then what happens after you burn the liquid fuel? You know, the emitted CO2 will go back to the forest and it will absorb that forest and it will grow some more trees to be feedstocked to the plant. So this is a global cycle. And we have calculated life cycle of the plant and the results turned out that life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions of this plant can reduce the CO2 emission by as much as 85.9%. So any more detailed data will be shown on my poster. So if you're interested, please visit my poster this afternoon. Thank you very much. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Daiki Chiseki, uh, first grade of the GSIS. And uh, my major is solar physics. Uh, my personal name is that, uh, contributing to the space weather research uh, from ground-based sta stations, chain projects. Uh, in my talk, uh, all I want you to remember is only two things. The first is, uh, what is the space weather? And the second, uh, what is the chain project? So please remember these two things. First, uh, I want to talk about uh, space weather. As Professor Isobe uh, talked yesterday, uh, space weather is a plasma disturbance in the inter interplanetary space, mainly because of the sun. And as you can see uh, in the left movie, uh, the sun is ejecting a, a lot of, uh, a lot, uh, amount of plasmas. And the plasmas, if the plasmas hit on Earth, um, many kinds of social influence can occur. Uh, for example, uh, huge blackout, uh, satellite failure, and the communication failure, and so on. So uh, in these days, um, all over the world, uh, to predict the space weather, it's called uh, space weather prediction, is widely researched uh, all over the world. And in Kyoto University, uh, we also conduct uh, space weather prediction research. And one of the projects, it's called uh, Chain Projects. So um, the next, my uh, very, uh, uh, important topic uh, about chain projects. So chain means a continuous H-alpha imaging network. Continuous means 24 hours every day. H-alpha uh, imaging means uh, taking a photo of the sun in a certain wavelength. That wavelength is very good to um, monitor the solar activity, uh, something like that. And network means a worldwide ground-based observational network uh, for coordinated solar observation. So chain means a worldwide ground-based 24 hours observational network for getting, um, for getting a photo of the sun. It's very good to the, uh, monitor the solar activity. And uh, I strongly um, emphasize these three points. Uh, the three points, these three points is very important for chain projects. Uh, first, uh, 24 hour observation continuously. Um, of course, um, Ground-based telescopes uh, can only uh, observe the sun in the daytime. But uh, if we build such a system, um, a worldwide system, um, as you can see in, the, this, in this figure, uh, we can conduct uh, 24 hours uh, continuously, continuous observation, even by the ground-based telescope. And the second one is good aspects for the ground-based telescopes. Uh, to tell the truth, uh, there are several satellite-based telescopes that can uh, get uh, high-resolution uh, images of the sun continuously, but um, the satellite-based telescopes are, can be affected by space weather and very vulnerable and very expensive. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the ground-based telescopes are now specific weather effect and durability and low cost. So they are very good for these three aspects. 
And the third one is uh, educational support. Um, uh, the cooperating countries are now uh, Peru and uh, Algeria and Saudi Arabia. And these countries are not well developed in astronomical uh, field. So if uh, through this project, these three countries can get uh, such an educational support and technical and scientific training and the capacity building we, uh, these countries can get. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, my post looks like that, and we are looking forward to having discussions with you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryusuke Kuroki. I belong to Professor Yamashiki's laboratory in g -Size. Today, I want to introduce Explanet database, Xcute, because I am a member of the development team of this database. OK, let's start. Uh, Xcode is an integrated database of confirmed Xplanets and has been developed and launched for the purpose of better complication uh, of these existing celestial entities in different star systems. You can check information about Xplanet uh, by not only Xcode homepage, uh, but also uh, Xcode desktop application for Mac OS. Today, I'll introduce desktop application mainly. This is a top page of application. There are many systems to understand Xplanet. For example, uh, Xcode can show you Xplanet orbit and uh, stellar stars and Xplanet map and uh, Xplanet descri description and some graphs. Uh, one of the most important system is a comparing module of several different uh, definition of uh, habitable zone. Uh, the classification of habitable zone for each host uh, is based on Kovalev's definition as a reference cases with two different sets of uh, coefficients. Uh, at the same time, uh, this database uh, uh, determines uh, a solar normalized astronomical unit uh, to understand uh, to understand to promote uh, easy comprehension of different star systems equivalent to that of solar systems and uh, each host star can be referred to in the catalog with its uh, is its habitable zone calculated based on the observed or estimated star parameters with its image generated in the database. In addition to this, uh, this database can show you uh, an intercomparison module with existing Xplanet database, uh, such as Xplanet.eu. Uh, you can use uh, this database for outreach and observation support purposes. Today, I have the desktop ap application, uh, so please try it during poster session. Thank you. Thank you very much again. So let's give them again a round of applause to all the students. Thank you very much for your effort.